was all just made up, that whole thing, you know? What? Just the whole, that was all fake drama, me and Kyle. You're watching the Jackson Podcast. Woo! Jackson! You're on the Jackson Podcast. I'm Bob Mentory. Make sure you stay tuned. The next episode will be a lot more normal and better than this one was. Take care, everyone. Yeah, what are we going to do? What are you doing? Check out what's going on here. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I got to stand here. <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Holy oh, oh, shit. That's an animal. What is it? Why did you put my mouth? <laughs> Oil. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Come here, this Jackson fucking house. <laughs> All right, today we have a very special guest, the voice of the gods, one of the most viral sensation the world's ever seen, the greatest podcast host to ever podcast, to ever talk on live air. He was the voice of Buffalo Wild Wings. He was one of the most controversial figures in the Nelk Boy saga. He also owns a Kentucky Derby horse. He's friends with Little Dirt. He's traveled the seven seas, and he's bet on every game possible without ever winning. He's Bob Mentory, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to have you on the podcast. About 75% of that is true. Okay. 75% Which, which part of that is wouldn't true. be true? The gambling part is definitely true. I had to slow that down. That was bad. I lost like a million dollars last year gambling. Wow. We got to get into that. We, that we need dark. to figure out how that happened. That was dark. A million of your Nelk own money. Nelk Boy controversy. The controversial. Up, controversial. No, Nelk Boy thing really wasn't. Me, I'm from Boston. I stand up for I myself. love the Nelk Boys. You do? Yeah, I think they're phenomenal. You know, I think that they're, uh, I think that, good to have you in here too, yeah. by the way. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think that they are work very hard. They have a really good brand and a solid brand, but there's just personal. Just a I, couple I like John and Sammy. Steve's amazing. Mm. I, I don't have that much interaction with Kyle, but Steve's amazing. I think, mm. I think you on that whole. Yeah, go ahead. No, I thought you on that whole thing was cool. Yeah, Steve's, I think Steve's great. John and Sammy and I had our differences, and Kyle and I had our differences. Uh, but as for the rest of them, when I say the Nelk Boys, I don't have a problem with the Nelk Boys. It's just more on the business side of things, just the way they cho chose to handle certain things. Yeah, we got we to gotta dive into that. Mm -hmm. I want to kick off with how did you even start with this viral and engaging brand? Like, how did you even build your audience? It seems like you have one of the most core audiences I've ever, ever seen. You you talk about a deer, gets a million views. You, you talk about some dude's backswing, gets a million views. And I've seen you swing. It's not the greatest, but you do have a nice stroke. But... How did you build this viral brand? Uh, I mean, I had a good voice and I did something that nobody else had done before, really. I think I think I just talked in a broadcaster voice on these clips that already were going to go viral. So it's not even that it's not that hard to do. It takes me like two minutes to do. But if you think about it, I already have these clips that go viral, like the deer sucking off the other deer when he's blowing the I actually I found out it's actually not a deer giving head. What is it's it? A, it's a baby deer milking its mom or something like okay. that. And so sounds sounds sweet. Yeah. So basically, I mean, I would take videos that are already going to go viral and I would just add a little flavor to it, add my voice to it, and talk in a broadcaster voice, say things that kind of broadcasters wouldn't, you know, traditionally say. And I've done that for six years just to kind of keep the views and the going. You know, every time yeah. I, every time I want to grow like 10,000, 15,000 people in a day, I'll just do a couple of those clips. And, you know, and then it just fucking catches fire. And you do it from your phone or you have like a team that does it for you? I do it all from right here. This app called Splice. I've been using it for the, since I started and I haven't changed. I use the same crowd noise in the background every single time. It's like the laziest way to do it. There's ways to do it better. But I mean, why why fix it if it's broken? Is Are you scared easy? of letting people know your secrets? Not at all. No, because I don't think this. you have to have a in order to be able to do what I do with the broadcasting stuff is you have to have a really good voice. You have to be willing to throw away any chance of actually working in a mainstream media network. Because Fox will never hire me. CBS will never hire me anymore because I've talked about and all these different things and, you know, commentary ways. And that they just, they're never going to touch me. You know, I have a lot of friends that are high, powerful people at the networks and stuff. They're like, Bob, we love you so much, but we're never going to ever hire you, obviously. So at this point, you're all in on, on social. I'm all in on just fucking craziness. W when did you discover that you had this voice? Like you have a voice that's like next level. I feel like everybody is like fascinated with it. They all love it. There's no doubt that people love you. So you have an amazing core following. When did you realize that? Like, hey, man, I got something special here. 
What I realized. What, what, what are we puffing on in the middle of the the podcast? This by is the a way, health bar. It's a very bad habit. It's a. Uh, is that nicotine or weed? It's nicotine. If it okay. was weed, I'd be fucking on planet moon right now. I okay. Let's do it. Okay. The uh, this is nicotine. It's a very bad habit. I got to get rid of it. These things are gonna kill everybody soon. So you're gonna just be hitting me like you know Khaleesi and the dragon the whole time. Do you Game want me not to? No, I was just wondering. Is it's, it gonna hurt the views or anything? It's just an interesting tactic. Yeah, I don't know. I just kind of feel like I'm the most comfortable when I just always doing what I want to do. Hey, do you? This is your stage. You know I'm just mean? on here. And I just like to, I don't know. I mean, I, I can stop if you want. No, I think it's phenomenal. I just, I just like, want the viewers at home to realize what's going on here. He's got a lime green popsicle in his hand that he keeps sucking on. I got this disgusting, awful habit that I have that I got to get rid of. Yeah. So, all right, where were we again? Oh, yeah, the voice thing. It just developed when I was, I don't know. I just, when I was younger, probably right when, uh, like, 18 years old, I started having a weird voice, and I started talking in a weird voice. And Hit puberty, voice change, and you were puberty, able to alter voice it? change, turn to this when I want to turn it on to this little broadcaster voice. and then Hit uh, me with, like, I'm Bob Mennery, I'm on the Jackson hi, podcast. Hi, everybody, I'm Bob Mennery, and I'm on the Jackson podcast. And today, what a beautiful day it is, Green Bay against the New York Jets. Here at ESPN, if you're just joining us, well, it's snowing outside. You know, I don't know, fucking, that, that's it. And that's how <laughs> it's I, good. I it's that good. was it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, then fucking just started doing these clips, and then boom. Not really that crazy. Even crazy. I mean, I don't even know why I'm here. This is really not that interesting of a story. No, it's a good story. Are people sure? want to hear about it. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm sure there's a million people a day that care about this. I mean, we, we've we seen your page. You get about a million views a day. We it's do get good. a lot of views. I do get a lot of, like, I'm very just raw like, with my shit. Like, I like to, like, just always, no matter what the fuck is going on, dark or not dark, I like to just toss everything out there without yeah. worrying about any of the repercussions. I mean, you're as raw as it comes. We bought you a first class flight here. You missed your flight in Boston. We bought you another flight for the next day. And then we booked you first class. I don't know how you ended up in coach in the middle seat. Yeah. But so explain to me, we've seen you kind of like your story. I think a lot of people already know your story, so we don't have to go too deep into it. But I mean, you started off as a golf caddy. You were living in your car. You're like building this like brand of yourself as Bob Menery. At the time, I'm sure you didn't have that many followers. I didn't even have a following then. Got it. So I was carrying golf bags at this country club, Wilshire Country Club, carrying for some cool people. I was like Aaron Rodgers caddy, caddy for Will Ferrell, carry a bunch of guys. And I would just... Uh, basically go to work every day at five in the morning and uh, try and get work as a golf caddy. But the problem is, you know, as a golf caddy for many golf caddies out there listening, you know how, you know, there's like 40 people in a caddy yard waiting for a job and there's not unlimited jobs on a golf course. Just decide who decides to play golf that day. And so you, you, no matter what time you got there, you know, somebody else would be called because they had like a family affiliation. It was like literally like a prison. There's like all the Mexicans, all the, I was a minority in the caddy yard. <laughs> And so what happens? You sit there and you wait for work? You sit there and they call like Juan, like Juan Pablo, like his brother, his cousin. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? Like, why the fuck am I not getting called? And then I realized they all just keep in the family because they like, if they have a job, say this, because you need two caddies sometimes for a job. So they would always just take their cousin. I was and what does fucked. a caddy do? A caddy fucking does anything from you're either holding the four putters, right? And then you're going around fixing ball marks, giving their, cleaning their fucking balls, cleaning their clubs, fucking all that shit. And then the other thing will be you're carrying two bags on a golf course, 18 holes a day, and just fucking, yeah, just carrying golf bags, telling them distances, shooting the distances. Hey, you're 150 yards away. The wind's doing this. The fuck. I was all fucking fucked up the whole time, but, you know, I did a pretty <laughs> so good So were you a good caddy? I think I was one of the best caddies to ever live. So what's it like caddying for Will Farrell and Aaron Rodgers? Aaron was, like, quiet. Will was, they kind of just did their own thing. I mean, I, there was... They played some big money games. Like Aaron played some big money games. Brian Baumgartner was another. Aaron, one. Aaron Rodgers is playing for money out there. Big money, yeah. Aaron would like play what's for, big money? A couple grand. Yeah, probably like you know five grand something per ten. hole. Nah, probably overall max exposure probably like ten grand. And so, is he winning or losing? He's really good. He's a one handicap, so he's he's really so. Aaron good. Rodgers has 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 it out there. Aaron Rodgers fucking all around has, athlete has it out there. He's an all around athlete. It's football Jesus right there. He's next level. He's a tough guy. He doesn't like a lot of guys. Really, he doesn't like a lot of people. So how do you pick you? I don't know. I just fucked with him early and then brought through Brian and then we just kind of became, you know, kind of buddies out there, I guess. So was Wibble Farrell, Aaron Rodgers, your two best people you ever caddied for? Yeah, I'd say those are the top two that were just like kind of, you know. How's Will at golf? Will sucks. <laughs> Will's fucking awful at golf. He's not good. Um, but he's funny as shit, obviously. And he's the exact same person as he is. And he's the nicest guy in the world. Oh, okay, he was cool. like, he would give me advice and stuff when we were on the course and like, because I was like, I want to be a comedian and all this stuff. And you know, he was like, give me advice knowing like this kid's a caddy. He has no shot at probably making it. But uh, yeah, Will was really, really cool. He's a good dude. And were you good at golf yourself? Yeah, I can play. I played some big games. I played against Mickelson for a lot of money. Really? I played Phil at Rancho Santa Fe, decent amount. And Did you win or lose? He beat me. We played my buddy Brian Zurif and him and uh, played 18 holes, cleaned the floor with me. He gave me 22 strokes. Phil's crazy though. When Phil like, negotiates, 
Like he'll be hitting balls on the golf range and then he'll come right up where you're all practicing putting and he'll just start working his game because he probably makes so much money off just playing rich motherfuckers that want to just play with him. And Explain just, that to me. What do you mean? He'll just hustle them. Like, I mean, think about it. Phil you, Mickelson will hustle people like people don't know who Phil Mickelson is. They do, but they want to play with him. So they're going to do anything they can to play with him. He's going to put the game in his advantage. So he's going to be like, yeah, you want to play with me? He's going to negotiate the game. He negotiates the game right on the first tee before you even go out and play with him. And what's that negotiation look like? Well, I'm like a fucking 18 handicap. And he's like, ah, you know, are you really? Now you're like more probably like a 16 here, you know? So he's always trying to shave strokes for you. So he's just trying to like get you to where he wants. And like, you know that you're not at the end of the day. He knows that not a lot of people are going to stick up, stick up to Phil Mickels and say, no, fuck you. This is what I'm playing to. So what'd you do? I didn't stick up to him. And so did you lose? I lost. But then I, had, I we played after we're done 18 holes. We're all eating lunch and we all decided to play an emergency nine. It's called. So an emergency, What's that mean? That means you want to play an extra nine holes. Let's go. Okay. That means there's enough gambling to generate to the table. Okay. That we don't give a fuck what our plans are after. We're going to go out and continue to gamble. So when you lose money to a guy like Phil Mickelson, are you PayPaling him? You're giving him cash? You have to wire him? I mean, I'm sure that was a big wire. No, I I, didn't, I think I just gave him a little bit of cash. And then I think I still, I think I still have an outstanding credit with Phil. <laughs> So you have an outstanding <laughs> balance that you haven't paid. I, think Phil. I owe Phil Mickelson money. I'm not joking. I Phil's really, on the live tour. Never, Can't we get you on the live tour? Uh, I mean, Nor- Norman's a good buddy of mine too. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. If maybe. you had to choose right now, PGA or live, which one are you playing on? Which am I playing on? Uh, I would rather play on the PGA because it's just it's cooler, fucking bigger. There's more people that fuck with you. Okay, yeah, but the live tour, obviously, the money's there. So I mean, the guys that are making the money on live, it's insane. What's like, your opinion on the PGA versus live right now? This whole saga going on. I don't give a fuck. I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter. Who cares? I mean, I guess all this Saudi shit and all that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's not. I'm not Everybody's getting money. I'm not the one to. I'm not involved in it. I don't fucking. I don't have an opinion. They haven't asked you to be an announcer on the live tour. No, but I've tried. I've I poked. I poked Greg a lot. And what do you say? They were considering like doing some shit, but again, I'm very very wild. So people, it's just hard to. I got to do my own shit in order. I think to make it really. Yeah. I mean, you on the live tour just seems like a match made. I mean, I can, here's the deal too. I always tell them like, I can, I can, I can pull it back. I don't know if we would want you to pull it back though. If you have to pull it back, I don't want to see you. No, I don't want. I want to see you at hundred percent. You want to see me just waste fucking, management? I want to see you on the whole going wild. That's what I want to do too. So yeah. yeah, we're not changing for anybody. Good man. So Buffalo Wild Wings, what happened? You were the voice of the of the wings mm-hmm. and the dipping sauce, and you were the little salary running around in the commercial. I mean, twenty six sauce and seasonings. That was my trade. Line. <laughs> Let me hear that. Twenty six sauce and seasonings. That's what I would say. Twenty six sauce and seasonings at Buffalo Wild Wings. That's what I would do. <laughs> it was the easiest job in the world, dude. To go in there, you would go in. And you'd have to bang out like nine commercials. You'd put the fucking headphones on. You'd go inside the fucking booth and you would just rip for like two hours the same shit over and over again. But then you'd be done for like two months. And how many commercials did you film for Buffalo Wild Wings? I mean, we probably had like 40. And what was the reason for the boycott that you called for a mass boycott across America, not to go to Buffalo Wild Wings? <laughs> what was the oh, reason for that? Well, <laughs> I don't want to see no one eating at Buffalo Wild Wings anymore. Well, was- no, no. Well, I just, you know, I have, I'm sensitive. So, you know, like, <laughs> oh, we know after three years when they decided not to want to continue with me anymore, I just, I mean, three years is a long time. I have to be pretty happy about that. Like na- okay. the voice of the national I'm surprise you made it three months with I the way you story how, everything. Bro, if it's I, not a sane convention. It's you complaining about your girl. I mean, it, your stories is one of the most wild. It's like Jerry Springer, your, your Instagram story. That's exactly what I'm going for. Yeah. But then, but then how did Buffalo Wild Wings like what did you kick them out or they kicked you out? They finally were like enough because of the stories, I think. Oh, really? Is and that what also it did? Too, I was I was starting to kind of, uh, you know, nothing against Nelk and stuff. But when I was partnering up with Nelk and kind of telling them that I was going to be doing some stuff with Nelk. I think they were a little bit hesitant as well for that, for that reason too. Oh, wow. But, um, so yeah, I mean, basically, but then what, 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 after three beautiful years in the relationship, why call for the boycott? <laughs> you know, because they had an opportunity to extend the services. And they didn't. Oh, got so it. It was like, you know, and, but I just, that was, yeah, it was dumb. I mean, Beverly Wild was great to me. I was fine with them. It was just, uh, it's funny. I don't know. I just can, think it's can you fucking give me, funny. Can you like, give me one of the commercials you did for Buffalo Wild Wings? I don't remember any of them. I mean, I was like, so there were some of those commercials that I was a little bit what? <laughs> under the influence for. <laughs> so if you walk in, if you walk they in like, to do it, if you like walk, send me home a couple times, like not today, Bob. I'm like, what do you mean? 26 hours of season. Like, that was so all is that all you had to say? No, I mean, that was, my, they had me roar the first time. I mean, the, they had you roar. Yeah. Like in what the way? first fucking job I go there for, I thought they were, I thought it was like, Nelk was like pranking me or something. Cause I go in, it was the first day I ever had to record shit for B-dubs and it was a March Madness for the. Play the March Madness tournament, the biggest fucking tournament's gonna be played all over the TV, biggest commercial run ever. And fucking, 
I had to go in there and they're like, hey, Bob, uh, you know, just roar for us. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about roar? They're like, yeah, give us like different roars like a tiger. Mm -hmm. I'm like, am I being fucked with here? So I just started roaring like for like 15 minutes and give them all different variations of roaring like a tiger. And then Can they you give us an example. Of what no, I'm not going to give a fucking example. No, just just like no, what do you mean roar like a tiger? I'm so confused. The commercial was like at the end of every commercial was like Buffalo Wild Wings roar. That was it. <laughs> Why is it so awkwardly quiet in here? It's just, it's, I mean, you're roaring, dude. You're like, you're like 40 and you're roaring. Yeah, it's funny. I'm 35 and I was 32 at the time. Why does it make sound 40? I'm 35. Are you really? Yeah, I'm 35 years old. Wow, you look great. Are you sure? Yeah. Right. Looks like you hit the Lido Hotel spa right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love so let, let's let's kind of go into this. So I think a lot of people look at you and they go, how does this guy know everybody? And one of the big things on Nelk was you always talked about how you brought all the guests and everybody knows you. And I appreciate you pulling out your Jackson chain. That's I a, love cu this that's stuff, a Cuban five millimeter in silver. Stuff. I also love this too, what you did for me. Yeah. I want to say you made me a custom Jackson Ripper Magoo. Uh, Ripper Magoo shirt. The only thing I don't like is I don't think you could have taken a crackhead off the street. And uh, and that's probably the biggest crackhead I've ever seen in my life right there. We you don't even know my eyes are droopy. Do yeah. I, I look like this? No, we just wanted to play into the persona of what people <laughs> thought, thought you look like. This is fucking brutal. That's the Jackson Ripper Magoo tee. Man, oh, man. King, well, I, King, of, King of the mic, the greatest podcast host to ever do it. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this away. Yes. Somebody. Yes. Because this is, I mean, actually, I might keep man it. Man of the this people. Is pretty cool. This is yeah. pretty cool. Man of the people. Wear so, that to Kentucky Derby. I'm sure you'll win. I you will. I mean, a lot of people look at you, Bob, and and once again, I appreciate you wearing the chain. That's the Cuban five millimeter in silver. I that's love our, the that's Cuban our number one millimeter. selling men's chain right there. Because you know what it is, too? I think Real people, people too, spend too much money on chains. Yeah, I mean, our chains are basically bold. They stand out. They're quality. They're all made in Italy, and, you know, they're affordable, and they're at the perfect price point. I think that's why everybody's coming to Jackson. Jackson.com, get everything you need. Is there, but, anybody has a, is there a drink here? Brad, you might grab me, like, a vodka and uh, <laughs> orange juice. Can we get Bob a drink, please, so we can, we can uh, like, any time today would right, be amazing? Maybe just bring the whole entire bottle. Yeah, just bring the whole bottle. Should we bring the Dambles Arian drink? Yeah, bring, I hey, love bring, me the, bring me the Dambles Arian tequila. I'm sure he'll love this. Danny Boy, oh yeah, I love it. Danny. Hey, shout out to uh, Bob's uh, assistant BC from Fred HB. Sadad. He's back, and he's in the he's in the Jackson merch. Yo, this is Dan's tequila, by the way. We're not sponsored. We actually just love Dambles Aaron. He's a great guy. Dan, Dan's for this. Dan, this is to you, David Bell too, as well. Unlock. I, I like the company Unlock too. I know that you. Uh, it's the new OnlyFans thing that they have. I don't know, but Dan Bilzerian's a legend. I actually met Dan years ago. Funny story. He goes, hey, let's go play paintball. I go, no problem. Let's go to SC Village, my paintball park in Chino. He goes, cool. I'll meet you there. He goes, I'm here. I go, where are you? It's a little. Goes, yeah, go ahead. What, what, what's wrong with that? Strong, right? Dan's got the strongest tequila in the game. Yeah, pull it together. Let's get him a chaser. No, it's, I don't need a chaser. No, I'm just I'm tasting it. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah give this? him a chaser. Red Bull. Just is there sugar any, free. Is there any alcohol? I'll take one of those too. Shout out to Ryan Checkler, sugar free Red Bull. No, and Dan, Dan's like, hey, I'm here. I'm at I'm at the paintball park. And I go, how how are you here? I see no cars. The guy took the first ever Uber helicopter and landed at my paintball park, hops out of it, and he's with a bunch of my buddies. He was with JK and all these guys and my boy J Rock from Miami. And I'm like, what are you doing, Dan? And he flew a helicopter with someone obviously and landed at my paintball park to play paintball for the day the guy is one of a kind yeah he spares no expenses to have the full experience dan we love you so have you ever been to his house in vegas oh yeah it's fucking wild he's got all the the, the baseball machines and the everything trampoline it's a fun factory for adults shit. Yeah. i'm sure you just have the time of your life there i didn't really do much i just floated in the pool i was hung over Oh, that's exciting. Really get to explain it. You get to go to Disneyland and you go on no rides. That's, that's yeah. great, Bob. So explain this to me. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks at you and they go, this guy brings amazing guests. He was the man, the face of so many podcasts, so many groups. You know every single celebrity. It seems like every celebrity has known you forever. Dana White talks very highly of you during press conferences. Ish, once in a while. Once in a while. And, uh, and it seems like, you know, you're in the studio all night with Little Dirk, and people are like, okay, what does Bob do? How does he know these people? Like, how do you know Little Dirk? Like, let's start with that. Like, I feel like these are just really interesting things that no one has ever heard from you. How do I know? And you could talk when you're done blowing that. No yeah, worries. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, no, no, no worries. My bad. I don't mean to be rude. It's just Dirk. Oh, no, it's great. Dirk has uh, always been just, I've been a huge supporter of Dirk's music, so I always play his shit all, all the time on my, on my stuff all the time. And so uh, I'm good buddies with this boy, Rel. Rel's his manager. -ish. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Dirk just kind of, and I, a lot of these guys I meet, as weird as it sounds, not, it's, not, I'm not, it's not like Grinder, but I meet a lot of these guys online. 
Oh, okay. You know, so just a like lot their of, fans of your videos. A lot of times on DMs, like either athletes will slide in and say, like, dude, this is fucking hilarious, or you know, I'll aggressively slide in to a bunch of people and just try. What does an aggressive slide look like? I mean, aggressive enough where when I meet them face to face and I haven't met them before and I, you know, hey, what's going on? Say, and this is not a real situation, but hey Drake, how you doing, man? Bob, nice to meet you. And then being like, oh fuck. I got to delete every DM I've sent him or else he's going to think I'm like the biggest sketchball in the world because I like sometimes hammer people in the DMs. So you'll send multiple DMs without oh remembering this one? Yeah. yeah, I'll sometimes, like if I want something to get done or I want to get in contact with somebody, I'm like the biggest fucking crazy man when it comes to trying to get their Yeah, I remember the first time you DM me back, you were just like, hey, F you. I was like, whoa, what'd I do? And you're like, no, nothing. You're a great guy. I'm just on a hot one. I was like, all right, cool. I love it, Bob. Yeah, I probably was in a dark, dark space there. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, you know, Dirk basically and I just became very close through different shit. And then, you know, he had his new album that he wanted to, he was going over that's launching very soon. Uh-huh. And uh, I think Rel and him were just basically like, popped by the studio. And so I popped in and uh, I mean, it was just, it was a very small group. We just walked in and uh, definitely an intimidating group in there. And and do you feel like a lot of these people, because obviously it's not like you're peddling a business or pushing a brand, it's mainly just you. Do you feel like it's I've very got, easy to authentically I build a like relationship? I feel like I don't want anything from them. Yeah. And I know that I'm only going to show support. Yeah. So, and like, I'm a, you know, I consider myself somewhat of a good dude. You yeah, know? you so, are. 100%. You are. Know, a pretty fun hang, I think. So we all I really just think that that's the reason is, you know, I'm a good dude. I show respect. And in any situation that I'm in, I always try and like, give i try and host like nice even if i get invited somewhere to like a fucking where they're like they want to take care of me i always feel it's my job to like host the situation yeah i feel like you were in the studio with dirt for like six hours like what are you doing for him in the studio are oh, you coming man. up with bars nah, nah. are we you just, ghostwriting we walked in and uh we just sat down and we just talked about i mean we just first talked about for like our my, our chick situation and shit you know i know he has his girl and my girl we talked about that for a little bit for like a half hour and because he's in his fields a little bit too on the on the instagram why? I mean, he writes a lot about India. His girl, a lot. Are of they them. still back? I mean, I don't know the situation there. I think that they both care a lot about each other. So I don't really know a lot too much about that. But they, uh, yeah, I mean, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're just sitting there and DJ Bands in there and Duty Low. And uh, I love that Duty Low. Duty Low's the fucking man. I love his scary that fucking song. motherfucker. Because when I first walked, first walked in there, you got to realize, like, it's the rap game. It's fucking dangerous it's, it's you're in la you know and you walk in and there's a lot of guys like all right who's this fucking white boy it's like just here are they pressing you they're not pressing me direct but they're definitely like you know they're definitely just kind of looking you come with security fuck no solo dello i have a guy outside that's not security what's he just, doing outside bc just if i have to leave you know i'm not gonna be like after meeting guys in the rap game i don't think you want to be waiting around outside for an uber being like da 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 just you know Oh, so you have a driver when you, you have go to the You a driver these, that's yeah. just there, of course. And so, um, yeah, I mean, they basically go all in there, and we just jammed out and played the new album. And the new album, he is, it's fucking insane. And then I would be like, I get so into it because I love rap so much, and I'm like, it's not my place to say this, but I get really comfortable fast. And, like, he would play a song, and it would be kind of, like, slow. I like the really hard gangster shit, and I'd be very vocal. I'd be like, dude, I fucking hate it. <laughs> I'd be like, I fucking hate it, Dirk. I'm not going to lie. So you're at a listening party with little Dirk listening to his new album. A song comes on you don't like, and you're like, hey, Dirk, I hate it. But then I would be like this. If he played a banger, I'd be like, fucking run it back. Run it back. Like, you know, I'd just get fucking, I love it. Like, I like, I like gangster hard rap. And I know I don't really. You seem like a guy that loves gangster hard rap. I don't know why I don't fit the mold to like it, I guess. I thought you were more of a Taylor Swift type of guy. I can get, I can get there too, but it's more just. If you had to choose an artist right now, who's your favorite artist? I mean, I'm telling you, I like Dirk and Duty Low together. Those are your two favorite artists right now in the yeah, game? Yeah, and their new album is ridiculous. Wow. Ridiculous. That's good to know. Yeah, so yeah. what's what's your favorite meal on in Boston? We saw you eating a lot. We saw you in your feelings for a few days. It seemed like all you were doing was eating. You were looking for meals. I saw you trying to put down something. What's your favorite meal in Boston? My favorite meal in Boston, I like going to the North End. If you've ever been to Boston, the mm-hmm. best place to go in the North End. So you go to Strega. Strega's a good place. They got great Italian out there. Yeah. Boston's a great city. It's very clean, very safe. No issues. You know, Are you born and raised from Boston? Born and raised from Lawrence, Massachusetts, just outside. Yeah. It's a but you point. claim Boston. I claim Boston because it's easier. Not a lot of people know Got it. At Lawrence. Does anybody get upset at you not really being from Boston but claiming it? I mean, I'm from worse than that. I'm from Lawrence. Lawrence is a fucking rough city. Okay, so Lawrence you're cool. a rough city, right, Brett? That's not far. It's a, 
It's a yeah. fucking lot of fucking the Fall River. Come on, please. So what's an interesting That's fact? That's why I think I get the hood in me. I'm from the, I'm from the hood a little bit. Yeah, you seem very hood. I know. What's an interesting fact? my fa- Newport Beach <laughs> Lido Hotel shirt on here. I, w- I mm-hmm. want to know an interesting fact about you. I want to know something. I want the people at home to know something about you that they wouldn't know. Like, like I, I heard I online suck. that you, you've never drinking a glass of water. Is that true? I, uh, I've never drinking a glass of water in my life. I'm an android. <laughs> so you don't drink water. I'm a water. fucking android. I've never had, I, I never had a glass of water. So I'm life. sitting here Optimus Prime. So you don't yeah. drink any water. I can transform it any fucking time you want <laughs> when I snap my fingers. No, I think one fact that people don't know about is I suffer from like extreme paranoia sometimes. What does that mean? Like just crazy extreme paranoia where, I mean, Brett could probably explain it better, but sometimes like, I'll just think people will be after me. Oh, really? Like in real life? Yeah, I like had to like just escape LA and like, because I thought people were after me. In what way though? Like, is this like mentally or you actually just feel like you did something so someone's after you? I didn't do anything. I mean, but I also associate myself with a lot of different people, so I never really know that that plays <laughs> in my head. But yeah, sometimes I just get really paranoid about certain things. And so I just like- Sometimes you should relax, maybe not drink, not smoke. No, you know, it's funny too. I don't like, I, I play this whole thing up that I- Drink and party a lot more. Oh, you definitely drink and party though. (laughs) It's all fake. I don't know if you really play that up. I mean, you definitely do. Yeah, no. But so I had like an instance the other day where like I was up for a couple days and I thought these like uh, rival people like were after me. So I had to like, I packed all my shit. I just left town and went back to Boston. (laughs) I thought people were trying to kill me. Okay. Then you obviously escaped like John Wick. I made it out like John Wick. Yeah. So you're good. Catch me if you can, motherfucker. Yeah, you're good. To the imaginary people that are chasing me. And then you went back to Boston, called me. We got you a flight. You missed the flight. Obviously, the you weren't worried the, at that the point. The only reason I missed the flight, and this is the reason. I, yeah. Because I, you know, and I think actually in my defense, but yeah. before you fucking trash me here, yeah. is I think I did a pretty good job of getting here in two days. No, you did. We, we love you. We love you. I mean, we love you. Pretty good. This Bob, is- Bob's one of a kind. I think everybody in the in the in the room can agree. Bob's one of a kind. Can we get a clap for Bob? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, this means so much to me here, guys. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, I want to make sure that you feel good. I mean, no, I, I think uh, you know what it is. And to miss the plane, that that was. Uh, I mean, you did, I you did in your defense, you did text me the night before at 11 p.m. and say, I never miss flights, but if I do miss flights and it happened to be tomorrow, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's, that's what I went to bed. That's what I went to bed with. Yeah, because I went, I went through a lot with something that happened in my life. And so I, okay. I needed to like, I was, couldn't sleep. And so I knew that if I woke up and by the time I fell asleep, it would be 1.30. If I woke up at five in the morning, I'm looking at three and a half hours sleep. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna if I sleep if I get up I get up if I don't I'm just gonna sleep and because I need to I need to get to sleep. It's very yeah. important. No, you're a good guy, Bob. We're we're glad you made it out. We're glad you made it to Lido Hotel in the Jackson headquarters. Why did Dana White call you out? Yeah, like why? Uh, I think that Dana called me out. So it was surprising me as ever. So this is when me and Kyle were going at it online. I decided to just go nuclear. Of course. And by the way, I think Dana White is the greatest chairman executive of any sports organization the world's ever seen. What he's done to UFC transitioned it to one of the greatest sports organizations in the world. So I do believe that we got to give Dana credit. Mm. So I think if he did call you out, it was for a good reason. I want to make that very clear. No, was it? No? No. Okay. I love Dana. We talk almost every day. Dana's okay. a great dude. Um, he did not call me out for good reason. Dana is a great man. He's done amazing things. He's done fantastic, fantastic things for me and everybody that I know, my family and all that. Uh, the only thing is, it wasn't really his place to get involved. It was me and Kyle fucking going back and forth. But I think the reason why he obviously kind of spoke up was because... He, you know, I think he has obviously some business ties with them, which is fine. Um, but also at the same time, he just thought I was being a pussy. You know, he's just like, if you're going to do anything. Because you were complaining? He's like, if you're going to do anything, just do it legally behind the scenes and just fucking like, don't stop being a fucking pussy and crying on the internet. And I'm like, well, first of all, that's just sometimes what I do, which whether people want to, that's just where I'm from. I fucking vocal. I just, you know, take it how you want. But at the end of the day, I was pissed off. You know, I was betrayed. I was fucking let down by these guys. And that fucking just drove me through a wall. Was Dana White your friend before Nelk? Or was he, was Nelk already friends with Dana White? So I had, uh, I had known Dana prior. Got it. And uh, then, you know, however they want to tell the story. Uh, but basically, I, I, I talked to Dana for a while about bringing these guys who I thought were really influential into the UFC and having the meet. And his kids, I guess, knew of him. But I remember kind of just, really pushing for Nelk and Dana to meet up and to get involved with each other. And that's when the whole, um, I, I thought it made sense to, you know, I, I texted Dana and said, Hey, what happens if we send Nelk boys to Abu Dhabi during COVID and uh, let's, you know, get them on the ground there as media. And uh, I think, you know, you guys are going to get along like fucking spaghetti and meatball. 
and fucking. Uh, Did you go with them? I went with them, but I had one of my panic things. What's that? So I had to get out of town. So I thought people were after me again. Really? Yeah. So I, I, I used the excuse that my dad's eyeball didn't work. Like my dad had an eye infection, which he kind of did. But I just like, I landed there. My job was done though. I got the guys there to Abu Dhabi, flew them. Dana put out this really nice like spread for us, welcoming us into, you know, Abu Dhabi. And I was there, it was quarantined. So we all were in individual rooms. It was like me, Kyle, Salim, all these guys, all in one floor of the W Hotel Yaz Island. And, uh, we couldn't leave the room for 48 hours because we all had to get tested and everything. And uh, basically, we were all sneaking, like sneak through the little cracks to like go and fucking party. But we couldn't leave the hotel for 48 hours, so we were all tested. You couldn't leave the hotel or your room? The room, because they had like they had like people in suits come up, because it was just the heart of COVID. Okay. And so then... Um, How does that work? Did they come and check you like every hour? Yeah, there was... I mean, it was like at a point where... I mean, Dana ran a pretty loose ship, but at the same time, he, he really had no choice at that time but to play like he had to be really strict with all the rules got it you know got it there's other players involved so we uh yeah we had people checking on us all the time and we had uh you know people with the tests and shit that would always come in and you know stick those things on our nose and do all that shit and you did that for 24 hours straight 48 hours and then right before we were about to kind of leave quarantine to go do all the cool shit because we were there for nine days I was there for two. I finally was just like, A, I'm kind of just over this. And B, I was just like, I don't know. I'm like, I like to be in places where I know what the fuck's going on. And I just felt like I just didn't know anybody. And I felt like I was just kind of, even though I was with the best and the biggest of the fucking people that was the safest place ever. I was just like, I don't know. I was all fucking sketched out. So and I told Dana. Bailed. So I called Dana. I'm like, Dana, you won't believe it. My dad, he's, he's going down, I think. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, his eyeball, it's all fucked up. I think he's losing his vision. I got to get out of here. You got to like arrange a plane for me. So Dana like arranged this fucking plane 17 hours nonstop from Abu Dhabi to fucking home for me with like, there was like two people on it, like a massive fucking plane. And he's just like, you're fucking nuts. I'm like, yeah, I know. But congrats, congratulations. You, you two are going to get along well. My job's done. And then I jumped on a rope and floated away. So you, you connect the note boys with Dana for this Abu Dhabi during COVID. They end up becoming this amazing relationship with Dana White and the UFC yep. and just kind of like, take over the UFC there at every event. Yeah, I think they added massive, massive value to the UFC. And I yeah. think that Dana obviously added massive value to them. Oh, I think that's a relationship I think made, that was, for, made for, I mean, that's a great eye of you, obviously, from a marketing sense, seeing that that would work. That's what I'm very good at, too. That's what that's what I'm very I feel good like at, that's too. Amazing. I almost like doing rather, because I don't even really like to work for myself, which is weird. I, I like to, believe it or not, like do stuff for other people. I like to like put other shit together. That's what I'm, I just enjoy doing. I don't know if it's more of like a agent mm -hmm. blood in me or whatever, but that's what I really thoroughly enjoy doing is just helping put people together that I think will do really well together. You know? And yeah. That's a good eye. I mean, I think the note was in the UFC connection is an amazing connection. I mean, the marketing, I, the content so. they get from each other, how they use each other and promote each other in a good positive way. I think they do great for each other. Yeah, I mean, and that happy dad shit, I guess, is smoking it and fucking Hollerhead. They, I know that they helped Dana a lot with Hollerhead and all that shit. And is so, Hollerhead Dana White drink? Yeah. Is that how that works? Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, I always see them working with each other. In terms of football, I want to transition to another sport. We always see you on and off the field with amazing people. You're always at games. You were front row over there at the Boston Celtics game. Third row. Basketball. Oh, you're third row? Um, yeah, I fell off a little bit lately, so. Okay. Uh, did you pay for those seats or someone gave them to you? Uh, somebody gave me those. I try and avoid as much as I can, obviously, paying for you know, stuff like that. I'll do it. It's good to see you still out there in the mix though. Yeah. I mean, I, it's my home city. I live 10 minutes in the thing. So, and I was in my, my, cause I shut away. I, I usually like, if I, I don't, I'll go in my hotel room or my thing for like three days straight and not see anybody, not go out and not do anything sometimes. So I was in that mode. And so I was like, you know, fuck it. I'm going to go out. And I went to the game and the game was good. I mean, they lost. I left in the halftime. I left at halftime. So you had great seats and you left at halftime. Yeah. I left well, at halftime. Why? Cause I had to go fucking see you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then you, you still missed the flight. Shit. You had given me shit, and I had to go see you. And then you missed the flight. And then that Good thing night, you I missed the, the flight. You know what I mean? So, in terms of football, who are, like, your three favorite football players? My three favorite football players are my three people that I'm probably closest to relationship-wise. I mean, either or. Um, I like to kind of see a sense of feel what, what you vibe with. I really, really love... I got involved in this like sports agency. My buddy has it's called Loyalty Above All. He has a little sports agency he started. So okay. I kind of got involved in that. So Dalvin Cook is one of his clients. And Dalvin's been a really good friend of mine, the running back for the Minnesota Vikings. Mm -hmm. uh, Marlon Humphrey is another one. He's the second highest paid cornerback in 
the for the Baltimore Ravens. And the funny thing about Marlon <laughs> is he's the cheapest fucking guy in the world. Really? He's worth like $90 million and he's calling me saying, ask if I can sell his fucking, help him sell his fucking kitchen table for $30 on eBay. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, bro? You made $95 million. And you're trying to sell like your lawn chairs and fucking shit on eBay and ask me to help you. And did you sell them? I tried, but it was brutal, brutal negotiation. <laughs> you couldn't give him a commercial? A like a, you couldn't give him like a Buffalo Wild Wings commercial yeah. and sell that thing on exactly. Craigslist? And then DK Metcalf's another one. Oh, I DK's mean, I'm pretty the much, man. I fuck with pretty much all of them. I mean, yeah, DK's the man. A lot of them. OBJ, your guy who is whatever, yeah. has always been really respectful to me. OBJ's uh, the man, too. That guy is the king of style. And it, to watch him continuously come back and come back and stay at the height and yeah. the, the mainstream press and stay in the front of the news. And now he's on the Ravens. I mean, it's going to be an amazing year for OBJ. Oh, the Ravens will be nasty. And they just got our guy, Zay Flowers. So I was at the NFL draft. Mm -hmm. So we were at the. Uh, what were you there for? I was there because we have. I have a little piece of this agency. So we were there. One of our guys was in it. So Zay Flowers was the wide receiver who was drafted how, by the Ravens. How do you help this agency? Do you do anything for them? Yeah. So basically, I'll. I don't have an. You know, I don't. I'm not an NFL agent, but I'll sometimes help them acquire some clients, and then I'll take a piece of whatever that client brings in. Oh, nice. The agency. Nice. Have you got any good players of the agency? Mm, yeah, a few. Nice. That's so. good. And is it true that you own a piece of a Kentucky Derby horse? Because I Not see this all, all right, so over. I don't own the piece of Kentucky Derby horse, but I'm, I'm working with this app, Commonwealth. So I'm bringing somebody to the Derby. Um, and through their app, you can buy shares of a racehorse and get involved that way. And so all the guys that I'm with uh, own this horse. But since part of this deal, if the horse wins... I get a piece of it, so I consider it I own part of the horse. I love now, it. So if your like horse wins the Kentucky Derby, you're getting some money. If the horse wins, I am getting definitely some money. Yes. Is that why you're excited to go? I am not. Uh, am I excited? I don't even know if I'm really that excited to go to the Kentucky Derby this year. Um, but I'm excited to go because I like randomly fucking with a random person. Like, I take, I'm take i taking this random guy I've never met before. Like and a random follower. For what reason? I don't know. I like to do that stuff. Like, you know, I, I just figure, like, you know, they have those NFTs, those shitty NFTs that people like sell and they scam people on and stuff. Yeah. You know, those like big ones that people pay, like, you know, the crazy amounts yeah. of money for. And like some of the utilities behind it are like, come to a game, come to, like, I just do that without having to buy an NFT. And so you're going to bring a random fan with you from, from Instagram to the Kentucky Derby. Yep. So I'm bringing a random person. Like, I did it before. I took, like, uh, uh, to Miami. I flew these two kids out to Miami just for, to hang and experience two days, like, with Bob and what it was like. And well, it, what do you do in Miami with a random person? So that's so what's a weekend thing. with Bob look like. So in Miami? like what they don't realize is they think they're coming over and they're just like fucking going to have the time of their life. But sometimes I'm just not in the mood to like do anything. So they came to Miami. <laughs> these two guys stoked as ever. And there was like 20 just hood dudes in there just blasting rap music in Miami. And we all just sat there for like two days and didn't leave the house. So that was like the experience. It was like, yeah, it was, that's basically what it was. <laughs> so these people think they're going to go to Miami with you and have the time of their life. Yeah, I mean, but they had a great the time. They, got the, they took the jet skis out and all that because one of my partners is uh, uh, in the marijuana space. And so a lot of the times we go to Miami, go to his spot and do the whole song and dance with the jet skis and the pools and all that stuff. And so, yeah. So they got to live a little, but they're not they're not in the club at live. I mean, look at you. You, you got to. You're going to go do exactly what I'm going to do. That's how the like, even for the Kentucky Derby, like I don't even have a place to stay yet. So this guy that's coming to win is coming with me to, and we don't have a place to stay. So, so, so where do you think you're going to stay? We don't know. That's the fun of it. We're going to figure that out. Me and the guy. But you don't feel like the need to maybe game plan a little bit and put it together. Maybe have the assistant BC over here, line you up in Airbnb. Well, now the BC's back to work. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah before that no this kid was coming in hot. and i also too i think it's like funnier that way too because also i mean he, he's gonna be we have the craziest shit we have like the finish line we have millionaires row we have like the most fuck you shit you can possibly have so what is that what's millionaires row what is the finish line um i mean we have just different sections that you can go into during the derby so right how'd you get all that through my partner one of my partners that i did the deal with so and you get to go to finish line and what? we get to go anywhere we want, basically on the property in a sense, because we have a horse too. So if the fucking thing wins, you're going to see me fuck with my shirt off running through the fucking <laughs> like this, swinging in the air with the fucking random fuck face. It's with me. And, and are, are you going to be mingling with Tom Brady while you're out there? No, not Tom. I don't think Tom fucks with me. Why not? I don't know. And I was a die. Tom is my, that's the guy I looked up to more than ever. Cause you know, from new England. So I would think you and Tom would be like best friends. Now that never he's had single. a chance to meet him. And I know the one time that I, UFC, I always, you know, get the fuck you pass from Dana. Like whenever I want, usually I call Dana and he's nice enough to give me like fucking whatever the fuck I want at UFC. But 
and he gives me like you know the back room because Dana does a really cool experience. He, he, it's everybody from Mark Wahlberg, Mike Tyson, Tom Brady, and everybody's just in this one room and just drinking, having fun. You can walk in between. There's no rules at all. Like you can puff fucking vapes ringside. Like Dana has no rules with his shit. He runs the best fucking. Experience. Yeah, he runs the best camp. But Tom Brady was in there last fight in the fuck you room, and I didn't get access to it. I think because Dana knows I would just go ape shit and like. Wait, so Dana denied you Dana access, denied the one, access the yeah. one time Tom Brady was yeah, there? Yeah, he did deny me. Yeah, because I think he knew that Tom was in there and I'd go crazy. And so what did you tell him? Like, come on, Dana. I gave him shit. Like, I walked right up to him while the fight was happening. He was ringside. And I busted his balls a little bit while. What did he say? Get away from me? No, nah, he's usually pretty cool. The Dana and I have a good relationship. But Are you guys actually really good friends? Really tight, yeah. Dana and I talk a lot. Like, probably much, pretty much. Probably, I talk to Dana a lot more than I do the average average person. Really? Yeah. And how did you meet Dana. Just through that, he thought my shit was funny, and then we started, like, whatever. And, uh, you know, I just kind of do what I, like I said, I always try and help him with the UFC. Did you ever work with the UFC, personally? I mean, I think that I've done a lot for the UFC without, like, technically working. I mean, God has compensated me before for, you know, like, helping a little bit. But is it, is it true he gave you 50 grand to shut up? Yeah, he gave 50 grand. <laughs> so, explain this. He just called you and said, yo, like, please be quiet. Here's 50 Gs? No, we just were, like... Uh, it was we flew. I was me and Kyle, and we went to Dana's office, and we were getting ready to shoot the first episode of Full Send Podcast. So we went down to UFC headquarters and made sense to start with Dana as an opening show. And so, Brett, were you there for that? Yeah. So I walked in, and uh, I uh, he just went back to the thing, and he took fifty grand out and just threw it to me, and was just like, "I don't want to hear you fucking me and Kyle. Don't want to hear you fucking anymore." And uh, about the like joking around, obviously. And I took the fifty grand. I was like, "Oh, thank you. It's about ten more of these owed, but appreciate it." And then you know. Gave it to Brett, I think, and Brett spent it on hookers. <laughs> BC. So does BC handle your finances? No. No. <laughs> Tries to. Who handles your finances? I have uh, guys who do that, but they uh, they don't have an easy job. But <laughs> do you have a team that's handling your team? Like, do they handle your business, your finances, your deals, your brand deals? It seems like yeah. you move solo. It doesn't seem like you move at a pack. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I basically, when I do stuff with different deals with different companies and stuff. I'll deal direct with them. And I'm just very You're pretty blunt on what I want and what I want to do. And uh, less is more like, you know, if you tell me less that you want required for me, I'll do more for you. But if you kind of make it like too fucking crazy, it's like, I, I'll a go by that. You know, I'll, I'll do more for you. If you fucking just yeah. make it easier. Yeah. In terms of business, like how does social like this media last app, Commonwealth, this little yeah. gambling app, yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. fucking they didn't, Fucking, they were just like, yeah, Bob, here's the deal. Here's a wire. Just do you. We don't even give a fuck when I give you direction. Like, just do whatever. And I'm just like, you're the fucking man. Watch what I do now. And I got them like fucking like 5,000 downloads already on their app. Like that. So so you're basically saying it's easier for you to kind of be organic and do what you want to do rather than listen to some rubric of deliverables. I just can't have, like, yeah, I can't have somebody be like, all right, well, two fucking swipe ups a fucking fucking month. And fucking, yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck that. Like, yeah. I'll do a million. Just let me do me. Just let me do me. Yeah. How does business work for you? Like on social media? Like how do you look at social media as a business? Because it seems like this is what you do full time. Um, I mean, look at I just do, you know, we had a grab made a lot of money in the podcast stuff. I made a lot of money with the B dub stuff, made a lot of different like I have little one off deals and stuff. There's ways I could do my business a lot better by getting a bigger team behind it. But I'm also somebody that doesn't really care about building this into fucking a huge, huge, huge thing. I'm cool with making a few million bucks a year. I really don't, you know, I don't need money. It's not that important to me. So, I mean, what do, what do you mainly spend your money on? Oh man. Um, Brett. Spend money on? Yeah. Uh, alcohol, <laughs> random bets around people, hotel rooms, flights, <laughs> um, and the same restaurants. Wait, hold on, hold on, Brett. Can we, can we, can we go slowly so I can let the people know? Yeah. yeah. Alcohol. Alcohol is not the case. Alcohol. Spas. Spas. <laughs> I can tell. That's why you have no bags underneath your eyes compared to the t-shirt. Hotel rooms. Flights. Flights. Wait, he have... misses the flight check. Same restaurants. He doesn't eat food at every day, but he orders it anyways. So you order a lot of food from restaurants and you don't eat it? Uh, Would you consider yourself wasteful? What I consider? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm getting, I'm getting better at it. You live and you learn. I've lost millions of dollars before. Wow. Gambling. No, I've lost him. I probably lost a million dollars gambling. What's the most you've ever lost in one day gambling? Three hundred thousand. What were you betting on? Slot machines. Wow. Okay. And what's the most you've made in a day gambling? Two hundred thousand. What was that on? Slot machines. Wow. So you're a big slot guy. 
No, I don't. I don't really. I don't gamble anymore. Why not? I don't gamble anymore. I really don't. You don't bet on games? Nope. No. And actually, I never really bet on games. Games are never my thing really that much. I mean, once in a while, I, yeah. I don't really gamble anymore. I just can't. A, I can't afford it anymore to even think about doing it. It's just not good. It was like I, I went through a fucking crazy ass run. I mean, I took a chance. And did you make a lot of money at the end of the run? I mean, what did I just tell you? I'm fucking down what? Oh, you're still down. Yeah. Bro, you, you never climb out of that hole? You can't make that back and gamble. You can't win, bro. It's impossible. But there's, there's, you can't, unless you're on the side where you're taking the action, you can't fucking win. It's impossible. Wow. Way. I mean, I, I fucking won. My, my biggest gambling story was I was at Cosmo, and that was, Brett, were you there for that? Uh, no, I was sick of my head. All right, so I was at Cosmo Hotel, and I couldn't get in my room for some reason. I think Brett fucked it up. <laughs> and so I went to the cage, and I took out five I mean, grand, and I was like, I'm just going to play for like 10 minutes. I had no intention of gambling, whatever. I took out five grand and I went into the high limit slot machine room and I just started putting in fucking, you know, hundred bucks in the machine and just fucking around for like 10 minutes. I was going to play. If I lost the five grand, I lost the five grand, whatever. So after like two minutes, I, I hit like a $2,800 jackpot. I'm like, oh, sweet, whatever. Then I move over. That one's hit. So when it's hit, it's flashing. They got to come over. They got to settle up with you. But, you know, for somebody that's like ADHD, Loves to fire. I go to the next machine while that's happening. So I put it in. Then the next thing you know, boom, I hit for like 3,500. I'm like, all right. So now I'll fucking go there. Go to the next machine. Next thing you know, I have five machines that are all like ding, 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 ding. Like everything. I had the whole fucking room shut down. And there's a like caution tape around it, whatever. I am up like 12,000 bucks. Okay. Got these little fucking slot okay. machines. So finally, they give me some money. I'm like, I wish I'd do. I'm up like 17,000. It's been six minutes. All right. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to keep playing a little bit longer. Fuck it. So I go into this machine. I put another 100 in. Boom. $25,000. On one hit, I'm like, fuck, I'm up 38,000. And now, meanwhile, I go to the other machine, put it in, it's like, bing, bing, I just keep hitting jackpots. There's this lady in the corner, like, smoking, like, three teeth, like, smoking a cigarette, looking at me, like, you fucking cocksucker. I'm like, yeah, what's up, bitch? Let's go. I'm like, come on over here, where it's fucking hot. And so then I got, like, everything. Like, literally, they come in, they're, like, putting caution tape around the whole room. They actually okay. they shut the whole room down for me. I made that up. But then, so I take my 25,000. Take my $25,000. I got $35,000 now. I'm up thirty. dollars Okay. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to get out of here. And they're like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to play the same machine again for a minute. I up the bet to 200 Put it in. Next thing you know, boom. I see 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace, all clubs with a huge bet. That is a natural royal flush. Okay? So I'm just like, holy fuck. This is a really big hit. Yeah. So the worst thing you can do is press the wrong button. Like, as you hit the wrong button, you don't hold all of them, you lose it. So I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, wow, this is a lot of money. So I'm like, hold, 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 hold. And I'm like, boop. And it was like $100,000. And I was like, okay, let's get the fuck out of here. So got the $147,000, handed it to my bat buddy in a bag, one of my partners, and... uh it was like, put this in the safe, we're fucking done. And so, ended up up 150, yeah, 150. Then I won another 50, so I won $200,000 that trip. That was like a month and a half ago, two months ago, I think. So you're on fire right now? No, I'm not really just playing right now. Oh, you're I saving just, that, that money. That was just two months ago. That was just, that was two months ago. I think he actually ended up taking the 200 grand too, because it was a deal that we had already, so I never even got it back. We had something already going. So the guy that you were with, after you made the 200 grand, kept the 200 grand? Yeah, kept the 200 grand. Did you owe him money? I didn't owe him money, but it was something like where I could have owed him money from something, a deal that we had. That like, I was just like, all right, yeah, you can have that. So you owed him money before you, the day started? It depends how you look at it. <laughs> well, if you make 200 grand and you don't get to take home the 200 grand because someone takes the 200 grand we from you. We worked it out later. All right. You know? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a very just, you know, that sit down with me. I'm just telling you, I'm very like real about everything. So Oh, I love it. I think this is why everybody loves you is you're real, you're raw, you're rugged. I wanted, made a lot of made, made a lot of wrong decisions, decisions in my life, brother. You know, I don't think it's wrong decisions. I think it's decisions that have built you. Your story is just being told. I don't think I think, you're, I think we're about to. You know, I, I dealt with a lot of distractions and stuff. That I don't think know. your story is even. I don't even people think I've seen the majority of your book. You're still in the beginning chapters. I mean, bro, I've done a lot of shit. I've done a lot, a lot of shit in my life. I think a lot of people 
look at what you did with Nelk and Happy Dad and Full Send, and they see the chaos. But I mean, you've dropped Nelk's name a few times already on the podcast. It seems like it's like a a bad breakup, but you guys both still love it, each it, other and kind of want to unite still. The way you talk about them, I'd be more than I'd be more than happy be, to get back in business with those guys. It'd be know? crazy to see like a reunion there. But in terms of <laughs> like bad. any bad blood or anything you regret or anything you would have done differently. I mean, the Nelk boys, obviously, Kyle and Steve and all of them had an amazing thing going. Yes, you propelled it a little bit, and you had the Happy Dad movement going, but they already had something going, and then you jumped on, and you kind of took that podcast. You know, you launched it with them. Do you feel like you regret what, what I, happened? Anything? I mean, the only thing I regret— I mean, you were, you were pretty wild what on I, social. What I would have done, which I, were, which I would have done differently, mm-hmm. is obviously just reduced the nuclear bomb— yeah, I don't down, think you, you needed know. to go to level 10 on social, right? But again, that's where I'm from. I just, that's who I am. And yeah, I mean, that's something that I probably should have done differently. I should have just gone straight to legal and just fucking handle it through that. And uh, that's the only thing I regret because I actually ended up fucking myself more because by doing all that stuff, it doesn't help your, your you know, brand. It doesn't help your case. It doesn't help I your- mean, do, do you feel like, I, I think honestly, I think a lot of people feel like the Happy Dad as a brand and like Nelk as a brand, Full Send as a brand, those are strong brands. Those guys massive. have done an amazing, oh, they, yeah, I mean, they're, they're the be- I think they're the, I think they're the best. I think Kyle is one of the smartest guys and hardworking guys I've ever met. I'm never going to take that away from him. Yeah. John Shahidi is one of the smartest fucking dudes, connected guy I've ever fucking met. I'm not going to take that away from him. The only problem that I have is that when you give your word on something, I, I look at it differently. You guys have all this fuck you shit going on. You have all this stuff. You're doing, making all this money and shit like that. You give me your word on something, right? Just don't don't take advantage of me. And at the same time, don't disrespect me. You know, like with yeah. that Colby Covington shit that went on. Yeah, know. I mean, do you, do you feel, I don't, I, I mean, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but do and you they feel were, like they, were, they, they put that on you or were you involved with that, with the Mazda oh doll, Kobe? God. I mean, did they? I mean, Mazda doll gets gets you know you know you got kobe there and masvidal and then someone gets jumped and all of a sudden they're no, saying this, they're saying you you're the one who told people dude, where they're like, at it's actually, break it down for us it's comical it's actually really really comical like i've talked about it a lot because this is the one thing that really set me over the edge this is when i realized like i was like man you know what fuck these guys a little bit you know what i mean like that's not because i always made a rule with kyle i'm like i know they're pranksters i know whatever i'm like just let me fucking show up let me execute my job for you guys let me just do my job just don't fuck with me that's it. Just don't fuck with me. Like you can fuck with anybody else. Just don't fuck with me. And so that night that happened, you know, we were just out to dinner and it was just me and we just finished the pod. It was me, Colby, and I think three other people. And, uh, I mean, dude, look at we, everywhere the fuck we go, we just talked about it. I take my phone out and I'm always fucking going like this. Right. And so are they. And so is pretty much everybody else live, you know, in the moment. And so that happened. And, I guess somebody saw it, you know? I mean, Colby reposted it. Nelk Boys posted it. And we were, they all, everybody, if you wanted to know where the fuck Nelk Boys, Bob, and Colby were eating, we were eating at Poppy Steak. It wasn't hard to find out. Shout out Poppy Steak. Amazing food. Love it there. It's great. Shout Favorite out restaurant. Grubman. Hey, shout out Poppy Steak. Best restaurant in my Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Shout out David Grubman. Um, Purple. So, yeah, and then basically, you know, he gets jumped after, and uh, they bolt. And I could have done the same thing. Everybody left. Like, when Colby got jumped, Everybody fucking drove away. Did you away. watch him get jumped? I fucking stood there because I didn't fucking want to leave our guy behind. It was our podcast. But did you watch guest. him get jumped? It was so fast. But did he really get jumped or did he fight back? Yeah, he got jumped. But did he smoke a few guys no, on the it way? Was no, t- it was so fast. He was like, <laughs> out. He like, <laughs> like real quick. It was like two guys snipped out of it and ran inside. And, and where'd he go? Right inside the restaurant called the cops. But he got hit? He got hit, I think. I didn't see him get hit. But I could tell because before, a moment before, he was perfect. And then he had the fucking tooth chipped and all that. So he got hit. And, and then, he was like, and then where, I where were him. you? During I that? was walking out with him. We were walking to his car. And then it was just, it happened so fast. Like, I'm talking point two seconds. And it was like, and then he ran in. And then, you know, Masvidal was like right there. And Kyle, you know. And that was it. Did Maz at all want smoke with you and Kyle? No, but I, because Kyle, they left, bro. They all left because they fucking, they were scared of the situation. Like, I'm not going to, I could have easily been in that car too and just been gone. Because that's where I got in trouble was I stayed with him while the cops came. Like, I'm not going to leave a fucking guy that we're with that's our podcast holds behind ever, no matter what. That's not my blood. That's not who I am. I'm not going to run from it. I don't care. Yeah, you're from Boston. Like, regardless of like, like I'm not going to do shit physically with these guys. But I'm gonna make sure that I'm not fucking leave your ass. So you stay with Colby. And so I then- stay. So then all the buzz happens. They shut down the block. All the cops come. Colby goes outside. I go inside for a minute. And the moment where I got 
everybody thought like Bob set him up or whatever was I'm the only one there and I'm walking to the restaurant and I just feel bad because, you know, we have a security guard. Nelk always had a security guard with him at all times. Okay. And so I just felt like he's our guest. Like that shouldn't happen on our watch. You know what I mean? Got it. Like no matter what, that shouldn't happen on our watch. But do you feel like Nelk and yourself could have been felt the need to feel responsible for that? Not at all. Oh, okay. Zero percent. That's the thing. Zero percent. It's not, it's not the only thing we could have done differently was just change our entire ways, who we were from the beginning of when we started this and not recorded live. But, but was we've Malls done that. At, the one that actually beat him up in front of the restaurant, or you don't know? I, I, I think there was two people involved. I don't know who the fuck the other person was, but there was two people involved. But Masvidal was definitely one of the, the guys it. that was there. I personally, it was so I, I love fast, all these I didn't fighters. Even see a lot of it. I think Masvidal, his speech out of his last fight, I think that guy is one of the best to ever do I it. Mean, bro, it's such his a backyard f- fights were phenomenal. His story is phenomenal. He fought Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns is an amazing guy. Gilbert Burns is next level. But yeah, it was just I, a really I, big. It was a really feels big, like it was a big miscommunication. It was just a pain in the ass. To deal with and then the but problem, how did you get pinned with i it? got pinned with it because the tmz video comes out and colby when i come out of the restaurant looks at me he says how does this happen and i'm just like dude i'm sorry like i don't know like you're on the internet with us like i don't know what goes on with blood between he UFC. was yelling at you he wasn't yelling he was just like what the fuck just happened and i'm just like bro i i don't know like the last thing i do and anybody can tell you like is i'm not like clickbait i don't try and create moments i don't care about fucking views i don't i mean i don't give a fuck about that but that's why i think people were like oh they did it for like views they set him up like what did i do when i call like Mazda, like hey he's here like are you friends with Mazda? no i mean i met him i think once i've taken a picture with him but no relationship whatsoever got it and uh, had no relationship with colby either prior and so it was just a pain in the ass so then after that happens kyle is just a fucking dick and you know when people started saying like why did colby call out bob in the tmz video then kyle pushed it to another level it was like, I saw Bob texting Colby just because, you know, he does best. He fucking creates stir. He creates buzz. But little does he know is that shit doesn't go away on the Internet. And so when the, he says something like that, it's going to go to the Internet. It's going to go to Google searches. And then when I have my own podcast show that I have to do now, do you know how hard it is for me to call like, hey, Morgan Wallen, right? I call Morgan. If I don't have a direct connection with him, I want him on my show now. Yo, Morgan, you want to come on my show? Hey, talk to my people. You know what happens when I talk to their people? They do a quick Google search. You know what the Google search says? Bob Menery set up Colby Covington. Nah, I don't touch Bob. You can't touch him. He just he's setting people up like, and so like, and then Kyle had so many times where I was like, bro, just tell people that this is a joke. Like, this is affecting my fucking name. And what do you say? And he just like never did it. That, that's what I was like, bro. That's just disrespect. So was that the fall of you guys? Was that, that was the-, the start of me just being like, like what the fuck? And then there was just other shit with like, I mean, bro, when you're making thirty percent of ad revenue on a show, and you know, you're, you're asking them to bring on ads because your real money that you're making on the show that you're working so hard for is, you know, Buffalo Wild Wings, go to here for 30 second ad, you know, doing 30 second ad with Buffalo Wild Wings and they pay you, you know, I had a brought an ad for $150,000 and said, hey guys, we put it on, this means $40,000 for me or whatever the math is. And uh, they'd be like, no, 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 man, we, we have, we're not going to advertise anything right now. I'm like, well, wait a minute, I'm making 30% of the ad revenue. Happy dad and full send supplements, the only things being pushed in the show right now, I'm getting zero. And yet you dragged me along for eight months and told me I was a partner and happy dad and we'll get the paperwork done. It's been eight months and I've been very kind for eight months. Like enough is enough. And so finally, after you get pushed to a certain point, you just fuck. Oh, is that what the original thing was? You were supposed to be a partner and happy dad. I mean, I was told I yeah. getting one and a half percent of happy dad and all this bullshit. And then it was eight months of just fucking talk to Kyle. Kyle, yeah. John, you know how the fucking works. It's business. Yeah. They chose to do business that way. And you know what? At the end of the day, they're going to be fine. I mean, they're, they're killing it. They're doing a great job. Hats off to them. But you know, they yeah, lost, they, they, they are lost killing a, it. They lost to Kyle lost a good buddy. Me and Kyle were best friends. He lost a good ass fucking dude, you know, in his corner. That's done a lot for him. I've done a lot for Kyle, like even little shit, like fucking a lot of shit for yeah. Kyle. That, yeah. That, like, you know, he has balls to do that to me because yeah. I've done a lot for that motherfucker. Do you guys think that the relationship you guys have is mendable? You guys think you can become friends always, again? I don't hold grudges, brother. I mean, I just fix what you got to fix, and that's it. You got to fix. Have you reached out to him on, on a personal it's, level? Or you, you can't anymore. It's too sticky. I can't, I can't anymore, so it's all legal now, but it's like. What about John or Sammy? I mean, they're good guys. I mean, bro, I did that for eight months. Yeah. You don't get it. It's like, did I reach out? Everybody asked me, did I reach out? Bro, we were for eight months trying to resolve this and, yeah. and we were so peaceful look at our fucking emails i mean look at this it ever goes to like deposition or anything like that yeah like go look at the fucking all the emails we've sent go look at all this you know we were yeah. very extremely professional and just didn't have what's your relationship with steve 
I love Steve. Steve's, yeah. Steve's actually done me some favors over time. I think Steve is one of the funniest guys, and I think Steve is like the face of the internet. This guy he does whatever he heart. wants. He has the biggest heart. He's the nicest guy. During COVID, we were buying stocks and stuff, and the guy would call me every day, and he'd like have a bunch of good ideas. He's just a phenomenal person. Every party, anytime, this guy's always smiling. That guy deserves an award. The He's like thing, the, heart, the heart of that brand, you know? The funny thing about Steve, too, is, you know, like all these giveaways and all this shit that he does is like, I've seen him so many times cameras off, like no cameras on doing the most amazing things for people that he doesn't need to do. Yeah. And you know, so he's, he's, that's, a, that's a solid kid right there. And he tries, yeah, he, you know, he just stays out of people. all, he stays out of all of it, but you know, it does hurt our relationship because we really can't associate with each other. Yeah, I mean, but you got to put yourself in his shoes. It's hard for him. He also, I don't blame him. Yeah. He's also the face of those brands and he's doing a phenomenal job. That guy's, he should get an award. He's probably the best content creator in the world. I mean, his I, reward is going to be, he's making a lot of money. That's good for him. I, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, but besides money, money, not everything has to revolve around money. Just in terms of recognition, that guy doesn't get enough respect for the giveaways and the things he does for people. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about this. Do you have any connection or interaction with Jake or, or, or Jake Gyllenhaal or Conor McGregor? Cause it seems like you're involved in this roadhouse movie and no one even knows about it, but we saw Jake walk in at a UFC fight. Like explain this to me. Am I involved in the movie? In the, in the movie. Probably going to win an Academy Award for it. So uh, you are in the movie. I'll be nominated probably for Best Supporting Actor. So you are in the movie? Am I in the fucking movie? I am one of the top characters' performance of a lifetime in this fucking thing. <laughs> okay, can you break uh, this I'm down in, for I'm me? In, I'm in for, for people about, that don't know. I'm in it for about eight minutes. So I'm at a UFC fight, and uh, I'm walking into UFC. We're walking down the main thing, and I hear this guy who's in an important section Kind of, you know, because you'll walk out sometimes people will be like, Bob, fuck you. No, nope, boy, love you, Bob. Hate you, Bob. Fuck you. Blah, blah. And so you'll hear a lot of different Is it shit. mainly hates or loves? All loves. Okay, good. That's why a lot of people talk shit. It's like, they don't say it, whatever. But <laughs> so this random guy comes up to me. He's like, hey, Bob, I want to put you in a movie. And I'm like, I look over and he's just sitting in an important section. And I'm just like, hey, man, yeah, sure. I'd love to, whatever. He's like, I'm, I'm doing this movie with uh, Jill and all and all this. I'll talk to you later, but it's later. And I'm like, okay, I didn't think anything of it. A year later, he calls me. His name's Joel Silver. Okay. One of the biggest producers in Hollywood. Okay. And he calls me. He's like, I want to put you in this movie. Um, and that's basically that. I need you to audition and read this, these scenes. And originally, I was supposed to play McGregor's role, but I was asked to play McGregor's role, but then it was just like, I was like, bro, are you fucking kidding me? Like, no, it's not going to work out. Like, I'm not that guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> they asked you to be a main yeah, character I, I and you told reading. them no? no? Yeah, I mean, I was just like, I mean, <laughs> I, they asked me to do it, but I think they were just sending a couple options to read just to hear. But long story short is I, I, I get the the script from them to read for the character Jack. And uh, I, I just put it off. I don't do it because I didn't really care. Really. Movies, I always wanted to be an actor, but at the same time, like it was just, there's not a lot of money in it. I knew there wasn't a lot of money in it. It would require a lot of time to make a Republic. So I end up waiting to the last minute. Then finally the director calls me or Joel calls me. He's like, you got to fucking send me this thing now or you're out of the movie. Send it. I was like 10 glasses of wine deep. And so I end up taking the script and sending over the audition tape or whatever with, uh, my girlfriend and my sister who read it and it was sloppy as fuck. If I had that thing, man, I should send it to you guys and play it right now. It's so bad. <laughs> and so then they, they're like, yeah, you're in the movie. And uh, we do a table read. That's the first thing. And it's like... Who's at the table? We did it on Zoom. And so it was Zoom. It was Jake Gyllenhaal, Conor McGregor, fucking just in all the actors that are in the movie. Any other good actors? Um, there's some good... I mean, there's some like... Low, not big names. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, Connor and Jake's two of the best names. Connor and Jake, That's all you need. Big, yeah. And then you got Bob. And then you, Bob Mennery's probably the draw. But the uh, dude, it's so funny. The table read too. Connor was just like fucking nuts. He's on his yacht, just sitting there, and uh, he just obviously hasn't really acted before, and so he's just like getting into it so hard, and, like slapping his dick on the table and shit. Like not his actual dick, but just like making all like he's just going nuts in this. Table read. Give me give me an impression of Connor during the table read. How does Connor McGregor do a table I mean, read for I don't the know. movie? He was Roadhouse? always like moving and he was just like fucking just I don't know. He was just like he had a lot of energy. What's like, he saying? I mean he's reading the fucking movie. Oh god, okay. he's and reading he's like, the actual and, script. Yeah, he's reading the extra script. I mean he's never he's never really done it before. But anyways, this is I'm going on and on. But get to the the movie and uh Jake and I have one really, really big scene together, which is fucking cool. It's like probably five five minutes long, and it's just me and him. And so I'm kinda I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but who gives a fuck? I mean, it doesn't matter. So I'm, uh, it's like Amazon MGM, huge movie. And I fucked up too at the end. I was doing so good being such a great partner. And then I fucking almost ruined the whole entire movie. I'll tell you that at the end. Anyways, 
Uh, You're seen with Jake. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching him. He's I think he's banging some girl inside the uh, inside the restaurant. And so I have my gun, and I'm sitting there with my boy Darren, who's uh, from Never Have I Ever. It's like girly little fucking Netflix okay. show, but he's like he was a number one Netflix. So we're like talking about he's in there, and then fucking I get out of the car, and I'm a gun. I fucking start to approach him as he's walking out. I just start fucking with him a little bit. And so we're just going back and forth, talking shit a little. And I'm just kind of like, oh, yeah, who's in there? Fucking whatever. And Jake's going back and forth. And then finally we get face to face and some shit happens. And it's fucking pretty cool, intense scene. It was a cool, one of the coolest moments of my life. And you're, you're acting with Jake in the movie. Yeah. Okay. And then do you ever interact with Connor in the movie? Mm-mm. No. No, well, Connor's, Connor's in the scenes that I'm in. But he wasn't shooting wise. He wasn't there on the days that I was shooting. Oh, so you never got to see him I on set. I saw him on set, but I didn't really fuck with him really at all. He was just, it was quick. I was done my shit and he was just getting. You didn't get to go say hi, get some content with Connor? No. 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 How's Connor acting? I did not see him at all. I know they got him a coach and all that shit. Yeah. Yeah. But it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting. But Jake's fucking ridiculous, dude. Is like, Jake Gyllenhaal one of bro, the best I mean, actors? The, one of the, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, I'm acting with it, fucking me acting with one of the best actors of all time. And what I don't realize is like you have lines, but he plays with them and shit. So like he plays around a little bit and I'm like, you know, I'm just like going by the book and then I'm like, we, t- we did 36 takes uh, of that scene. Oh, wow. 36 takes. And then, and then did you finally nail it? No. Then we had to reshoot it the next fucking day. <laughs> Why did you have to reshoot it? Honestly, to be honest with you, Jake, it, it was actually kind of Jake's fault too. He forgot some of his lines too. It wasn't just me. <laughs> so Jake fucked up too. Like, I don't even care what anybody says. Jill and all fucked it up a little bit too. So if he's, so, like, so he'll Jake listen to this. Jake will listen to this too. He knows. Me and Jake are fucking boys. He, 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 he's a fucking man, dude. Jake, Jake and I built a great relationship after that fucking thing. So how did you almost ruin the movie? How did you almost ruin so, the Roadhouse movie? So I get, I'm in Vegas on a five day fucking zinger, and uh, <laughs> and uh, Joel's there, and uh, he's like, "Who's Joel? Joel, the producer." Okay. And he's like, "All right, Bob, listen now. Unfortunately, we got this shot." He's like, "Old school Hollywood." He's like, oh, we, we got to shoot another scene, you know, but basically we don't know how you got there. And then, so we got to add a movie scene. So we're going to shoot the scene in the British Virgin Islands. You're going to fly down uh, in, in two days. We're going to fly out there. It's just one day. Uh, Doug Lyman, the director who did Born Suprema, whatever they are, the Born movies and all that. He's like, he's coming down. He's flying down in this private jet. We're all going to go down there. I'm like, yeah, fuck it. I'm in Vegas. I'm like, done. Let's do it. We're all in. Set it all up. So they set up the whole thing. They moved the, the seclude. The, I think it's called like this. Some boat. Big ass yacht that they have. They just moved it all to the middle of the ocean in the British Virgin mm-hmm. Islands. Everybody's flying down, the whole crew, crew, just for my scene. Because I have to like make sense. This of is Bob's it. moment. Not my moment. I don't want this moment either. This is, this I, is the I moment. This Vegas. is the moment you've been waiting for. But then, anyways, uh, I realized like 24 hours before, I'm like, fuck, I don't have my passport. And I have to be there in 24 hours. And so I call Joel and I'm like, hey, Joel. Uh, I don't know if I can come. I, I don't have my passport. He's like, what? What do you mean you can't come? Like, are you, fucking, you ever want to work in this city again? You ever want to work in this town again? I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> this is not good. So fucking I have to be there in 24 hours, and I have no passport. I don't know to get down there. Long story short is now all of Hollywood, Amazon, MGM, are all trying to figure out how to get Bob into this country without a fucking passport. And so we try and get it last minute from the sketchy-ass guy, Rico, or something, and pay him like five grand. Didn't end up happening. <laughs> They have to call the British Virgin Islands government or something and try and negotiate a deal for one day where I can come down there. Long story short, I have to land now in St. Thomas in American waters. They were going to move the whole scene to American waters because I fucking didn't have my passport. Land in American waters, take a speedboat with these two fucking dudes into international waters, cross in to shoot the scene, go shoot the scene in international oh. waters. Like it was like fucking James Bond dude getting the scene done and then had to fucking shoot back and fucking. So how did you nail it? How did I nail what? The scene. I mean, I don't even know. I just had to like go in. I just, they drove me across in the middle of the ocean. And then when I came back, that's <laughs> where, where did you land? I landed in St. Thomas because I had to land in the, in the American. <laughs> and then you had to take a speedboat to I, international a water? Yeah, speedboat like an hour and a half and like passed up customs and everything. <laughs> you shot the scene in the middle of American waters. Uh, or international waters. On a boat. On a boat. And then on the way back, I got <laughs> fucked by what? customs. Why? Because I, they're like, where the fuck were you? Where did you come from? Like, What'd you say? <laughs> I was like, I'm Bob. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Bob. I'm like, I'm a you fucking American the, spy. You have some of the most interesting stories I think the world's ever heard. I mean, that's just not a normal thing. You do realize, like, do you ever take a second to sit you, back for a second and realize wanna, how blessed you, you are? You want to hear some other crazy yeah, stories? Yeah, of course. I once, I, I took so many, uh, no, I didn't take so many. I was 
like so I evacuated people out of Afghanistan. Somehow I found a way. <laughs> I was so I was working with the helping evacuate people out of the Afghanistan when Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. And somehow because I was so zapped in my hotel room, somehow got involved in, in evacuating a bunch of people. I can't get into too much detail of it. <laughs> Wait. So you evac you you helped people evacuate out of Afghanistan. I have a lot of friends in a lot of different places. And I, so I can tell. Basically you and half a horse, was, you're sitting working, third row at a Celtics game. I was working with You're a well couple of guys that I knew and was just talking to them and okay. friends with them. And I was just, they were building these, uh, I forget exactly how I got involved. I was so zapped. It was like four in the morning and I was just so into the Afghanistan stuff. I was posting about it a lot and all that. And a couple yeah. of the government guys were like, hey, you can help us out with some stuff. We got some people trapped there and like we needed to do some stuff and I needed to like tie some people together. And like, like, and then I ended up, I got like, I think I got like 18 people out of Afghanistan right when that airport was happening. Okay. And, uh, Oh, when we, when we left Afghanistan, I was getting people up to, I had people that I, people that was getting out of Afghanistan that were like, I didn't know personally, but they were like friends of the people that I knew and right up until the bomb went off in the airport. Remember that? Yeah. So like real time people were hanging on the, on the, on the helicopters in the planes. Bro, that was crazy. That was insane. That was absolutely insane. That was something yeah, random that I did. I find myself in like random situations sometimes, but I just... How do you get in these situations? Um, I just like to help. Okay. I like to like take on At different At the core challenges. of it, is that what it is? You like to give back, work with people and help? Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the core is. I probably have to sit down with like a therapist or something and talk and figure that out. So for the Dennis Rodman Award, who are your five favorite athletes of all time to party with? Um, the five top five that I, for me to party with yeah. that I have party with? Yeah. Fuck, I'm going to need help. Brett, what do you think? Five athletes? Athletes to party with? Yeah. Uh, J.K. Dobbins is one JK of them. But J.K. Right? fucking and I got twice almost got in a fist. J.K. Yeah. would beat the fuck out of me twice. What'd you do to him? Marlon. Just talking shit. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Marlon doesn't party, though. Overall celebrity athlete status, who have you had the best time with partying? Most fun probably was Morgan Wallen. Really? Why is that? He's a legend. Morgan's great. This was right great after music. he was, you know, canceled for that thing. And then uh, we kind of hung out a few days, and he's just the man. That was the first night I hired Brett. It was the first night that I ever hired Brett. Was his first assignment at three in the morning was to hang out with Morgan. So I had him. I hired him on the internet. We met through DMs. I had him get a book an Airbnb in Nashville, and I said, "I'm gonna come down there. Fuck it. He bothered me enough to, you know, want to work with me." And I said, "All right, just book me this place. Stay down there." I didn't show up for a few days, so he's like, "What the fuck's going on?" And finally, after three days, I show up at the Airbnb. I'm like, hey, what's going on? It was like one in the morning. And uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to bed. Uh, I'll get you up in the morning. We'll just figure some stuff out and whatever. So I go to bed. He goes to bed. He's been sitting in Airbnb three days in Nashville. Like, what the fuck's going on? By himself? By himself. And then... Uh, it's a great way to treat your assistant first day on the job. It wasn't even my assistant. He was just a dude. And so then I end up waking up. I get a call from Morgan at like three in the morning. And Morgan, by the way, is like not a party person really anymore or anything like that. But he was probably having fun during the stage a little bit. He's allowed to. And so he's like, yeah, come on out. Let's, let's hang out. So I'm like, all right. I go downstairs. I wake up Brett and I'm like, all right, first mission. We're going to see Morgan. We're going to fucking party at Morgan. So it's three in the morning, go down there. He comes down with me and uh, Brett does. And they end up hanging out for the whole night. I went home to sleep. I get a picture from my driver and it's like Brett passed out in Morgan Mullen's lap at like eight in the morning. I'm just like this fucking kid. I hired this kid to come down. He's a fucking drunken fucking train wreck. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, great. So next day he comes in. I'm just like, bro, this isn't how I run my shit. I camp here. I, I mean, this is how you run your camp. That, you, know what, you know what's funny? Can I, can I tell you about this? This this hurts. Because I. this is a sign of, this is not a good sign. When you see somebody like this, you're like, their life's a mess. This just fucking happened. I, I made it two and a half years with this fucking thing, I think, not being broken. Maybe it's time to restart. No, nah, we're always good. Okay. What is your favorite city to get zapped in? Favorite city to get zapped in is going to have to be Los Angeles. No, fuck that. I'm sorry. Uh, my, I mean, now it's, I think it's, Vegas is fun now. I love, Vegas is my favorite. Oh, wait a minute. No, Scottsdale. Oh, Scottsdale's Scottsdale's amazing. Yeah, come on. Like, if you're going through shit. Scottsdale's amazing. If you're in a fucking, getting out of a relationship, or you're having some trouble, you go down to Scottsdale, nobody gives a fuck. Nobody talks down there. There's no drama. You go down there, fuck whoever you want. Nobody cares. What's, uh, what's your, what's your favorite sporting event you've ever attended? I feel like you've gone to a lot of events. I go to a game a week every week in the NFL season. I went to the Super Bowl a bunch of times. I've been to golf turns, waste management. The favorite one, UFC, by far. There's nobody ever that does a better job than the UFC at putting on a fucking sport. I agree. There's fucking nobody by far. 
Because he, Danny just doesn't give a fuck, like I said. You can do whatever the fuck you want. He's the best. He is the best, and he's done such a great job with that. Is there anyone on your bucket list that you'd love to interview? Denzel Washington, probably. Tom Hanks would be cool. Really? Yeah. Cat Why Denzel Taylor. Washington? Because uh, I was a, I studied theater and acting growing up, so I wanted to do uh, acting, so I was just to watch, like, Denzel and all that stuff. Yeah, it makes sense. How do you prepare, like, for, for interviews, for podcasts? It seems like you're always very freestyle. It seems like you just kind of like wing it do you really like prepare do you ask yourself questions do you learn about people or do you just kind of let them talk like we watched a lot of your full send nelk boy that's like a lot of shit i got a lot of shit for not preparing stuff really but this is the thing i don't i don't prepare because you know why a i this is people are like oh bob asks dumb questions it's like a strategy that i have like i do it on purpose because i want to learn i'd like to because i feel the conversation flows more true and free if you don't know the information so, like, if you're just sitting down with somebody and you're just, like, getting to know them, you mm-hmm. already know all the information. Mm-hmm. The conversation changes. It's different. So, I'd like to go in with little prep as possible. If it was somebody like a Candace Owens we're sitting down with or, like, a political person, I'll try and study up a little bit. But who Who is your favorite person that you interviewed so far? I loved getting high with Mike Tyson. That was really fun. That was all John. John set that up. Um, getting high with Mike Tyson was fun. Portnoy was great to sit down with Portnoy. Again. Yeah. Are you and Portnoy good? I mean, I feel like there was a lot of beef between you two. It wasn't really beef. I was just young and kind of, kind of coming up in the social media stuff. And I, I think we had, yeah, I don't know. We had a little bit of beef, but now we're good. I don't think there's, we actually talk once in a while and shit like that. But what, what are your three favorite golf courses that you've ever golfed at? Um, Riviera is one of them. That's great. I like the preserve. Or reserve, I think it is in Northern California, mm-hmm. and um, MP, M, uh, MCP. What is it? Fucking I forget what it is. Spyglass, the one that next to Spyglass. I forget. I don't know. Is there anybody that you enjoy golfing with more than others? I always like playing with my buddy Brian Zuriff, who's a producer. Got it. Um, I don't really play a lot of golf anymore, though. Much. Why is that? Just because I felt I, I broke my sh- shoulder on my a scooter. I was racing brett and summer home on a scooter and uh i hit a pothole and flew in the air like 40 feet and landed and my shoulder literally snapped in three and uh, never got looked at never got it fixed and it's so i can't really swing as much as i used to be able to really does it hurt you no it feels great <laughs> does it hurt you that you can't play golf as good as you used to I can still play though. So oh, if there's oh, like okay. a money game or something, somebody challenged me to a money game or something like that, I can step up and play. Do you, do you still think you have a nice swing? I have a fucking great swing. I'm a great golfer. Oh, you are. And I play scratch golfer. Like, when people talk shit. I play like I turn it on. Are you a scratch golfer? Um, no, I'm like a ten, but I can play like a scratch if somebody pisses me off. Oh, so you have it in you. You're him. I have it in me, but I can't. I couldn't do it consistently over time because I'm too my I, I, too distracted. I suffer from severe ADHD. So we've seen a lot going on with you and women and the Nelk Boys and this and a lot of your controversies. I feel like you you put them on social. You want people to feel involved with your life and feel what you got going on. And I feel that's why your audience loves you. When it comes to women, what do you look for in a, in a woman? What do you look, what are the qualities that attract you to a woman? Nothing anymore. Nothing? No. Why is that? I mean, I just have no interest in really, after, if I decide to... I'm probably going to not be in a relationship for a while. So I'm going to focus. I feel like a lot of people say that when they get hurt, but you got to get back on the horse. No, 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 I'm no, no, I'm not going to fucking do. There's no fucking chance. I had two and a half years of being in a relationship with somebody and I, I make priority number one and make business priority number two. And then, you know, you'd fall out. It's like, what the fuck was I doing? Why did I move business to two? Business should be one. So do you feel like it's hard for you to balance a relationship and business at the same time? Yes, only because I'm very giving to my relationship, and I'm very like really. Like I said I make it number one. Really. So like whatever will be happening, I'll always make sure that that's taken care of first. Are there keys that you kind of incorporate into your relationship with women to make sure that it stays healthy and it stays fun? I mean, it's the most fun in the world. My rela- if you're in a relationship with me, it's the best fucking thing in the world. What yeah. does a relationship look like being in with Bob? I mean, we're just there's no. I mean, talk about just the most spontaneous. Fun, like I mean, I'll just wake up and be like, "Yo, let's go to the fucking 49ers Monday Night Football game tonight." Let's go to fucking this. Let's go to that. Like, I like to just move. You know what I mean? So, and girls like that. But there was a time where, like, you know, I was dating that girl, obviously. And it gets tiring. Because I, I don't like to. I, I, don't, I don't stop. You know, I like to be like. It gets tiring for the girl or tiring some, for the relationship? Sometimes it gets tiring for the girl. But it's, I, I think it just keeps it. 
you got to keep it active if you have the means to be so, able to do that. So for the guys listening to this that are in relationships and they're trying to figure out how to make their relationships healthier, you think by being spontaneous and staying active that that helps well, you got to have the means to be able to jump on a plane and go and fucking go to a game a week in the NFL got it. and do shit like that. But for guys who are listening, and I mean, yeah, you just got to keep surprising and keeping on their toes. Do you think women are attracted more towards a guy that can kind of pull those things off or a guy that can kind of give them that affection and kind of just be there for them? Every woman, I think, is built differently. Really? I think everyone is. I think that the I think a majority of them are all bullshit, though. You know, I think that a lot of the women out there are just fucking bullshit. Do you think that's just because Same you've got? You, is that just because you've gotten hurt that you have this pessimistic view now? No, I don't have pessimistic pessimistic view. There's good girls out there, but there's also just fucking. I mean, the girl I was dating is a great girl. It's just yeah. fucking. I mean, and again, I'm a lot to fucking deal with too. So like, I mean, you, you don't seem like you're maybe the the easiest at right. times. So I don't blame you yeah know, whatever the fuck it is. But I'm just always about respect. And, uh, you know, just always shoot me straight. Don't waste my time. Do you, do you like to DM girls to get their number and to kind of like talk to them and try to get to know them? Or do you like to meet them in person? When I, I'll do a lot of stuff like on the DMS and shit that I'll just like, you know, slide in and then just forget about it. And are, what do you do? Are you sending them video screenshots of like your videos with Nelk? Like, look how many views I got. Like come date me, baby. No, I just use like, yo, what's good. Oh, yo, what's good. That's easy. Yo, what's good. That's it. And then, uh, let's hang out. That's it. That's it. And like you taking them to a dinner, you going to a game, or you whining Usually, and dining. Yeah, just like trying like have them at the crib and have a drink and just. So for first dates like a crib night with the drinks, get to know them. Second dates courtside at a Boston game. No, nah, I don't really take them to like fuck you shit. If oh I, really? If it's just a no, I mean because my goal is if I'm single, I'm just trying to hook up with them. Like, I'm not trying to build a relationship. <laughs> okay. So like my goal is just like let's hang out, let's kick it. I'm a gentleman. Like I'm not gonna like try and make fucking moves on you, but come over the house and kick it and so that's it that's that's the bob's moves right there yeah but that was like that's that was i mean i haven't been in the game for fucking two and a half years but are you about to be back in the game no i'm gonna just do all work shit that's why i'm here with you i love that you're from boston i want to transition into sports real quick what are your thoughts on the patriots on mac what do you think's going on with that dynasty that franchise i mean they're never going to be a super bowl team why is that for a while because you need a great quarterback and i think that mac is he's just he's too young there's too there's no there's no the patriots are going to be this they're going to be a fucking First round playoff team. That's it. They're gonna that's be it. like that's it. They're not gonna. Is that not. dynasty ever gonna come back? Like what we saw with Tom Brady? Not for a few. Not for five, ten years. Really? Yeah. No way. Got not, it. Not Super Bowl level. I mean, they might. They might. I mean, Mahomes has got that league and locked up for a while, and Burrow, and there's just too many good teams. Who, who do you think are the top quarterbacks in the NFL right now? I mean, Burrow's about to get a fucking payday. Um, Joe Burrow's definitely, I think, up there. I mean, Mahomes is obviously the best to one of the best to ever do it. Um, and yeah, but we had a lot of good years with Brady, man. It was fucking awesome. So would you say right now, Burroughs and Mahomes are probably the two best quarterbacks in the NFL? Yeah. 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 In terms of sports gambling and sports books, we see you work like what sports gambling sites and sports books. And then we see everybody getting brand deals and we feel like gambling's like just at an all time high right now in the U S yeah. and your voice and your, your following and the way you operate, I feel is like a, is like a core demographic of that. What do you think makes this like idea of sports gambling so exciting right now in America. Like, why is it taking off faster than it's ever been before? Because it's becoming fully legalized everywhere. So, and anything with that much money involved, and now that's fully legalized, they're gonna start paying all these people mm -hmm. to make it really interesting. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think the world's going to shit with this shit. I mean, this shit now going state by state, and when it's fifty states across the U.S. all fucking legal and people gambling like crazy, it's just not good. So it's fucking, it's gonna be just insane. The whole entire. I love it. So before before we wrap this podcast up, we've seen you kind of transition from you know the Buffalo Wild Wings saga, the Nut Boy saga, your own story. You're building your own reputation, your own brand, and we see kind of like you know obviously the Nut Boys are going to keep doing their thing. Buffalo mm -hmm. Wild Wings is going to stay a business. Golf courses are going to stay operating. A lot of these things just come in and out of your life like chapters, and you're still writing your chapters and you're building an amazing core following. And the way you look at business, I think, is pretty unique. And you are a good guy. I think the business of social media is evolving, right? I feel like people on social media can make a lot of money creating content, having vertical platforms, being able to talk to their audience at any moment. What do you think is next for Bob Mentory? I mean, hopefully you can take over River Magoo and figure out what to do with it. Help me out. Are you busy? Is it is your is your idea to build a brand? Is that what's next yeah, for you? I think now that, I mean, I, I, I think that I want to do that. Yeah, I think that if we have, like you said, all those things going for us, why wouldn't we kind of just, you know, I went through a lot of shit as far as just, my focus elsewhere. So now I think it's time that, all right, let's actually give it a real run at this thing, you know, before it's too late and before we make too many dumb mistakes and it all goes away. Don't do, you, want. do you feel that 
it's Ripper Magoo's. Do you feel like you're passionate about a certain niche or certain industry? Or I'm no? open to everything. You're open to I'm everything. I'm open to any way that we can, you know, end this story with a happy ending. And is your idea to kind of just build your own brand now? Is that where you're at? Or are you trying to look for a brand to partner with and to be a part of and to kind of take that into the next level using your platforms? Open to all options. I think the easiest one is to jump on something that already has a little momentum going. Yeah. Just because like, you know, for me to try and I've tried to kind of do it on my own and build it on my own and do all yeah. that stuff and trust people. To, yeah. It was a headache. So it's probably easier to just get a little less, but jump mm -hmm. on board. Something's already are you doing your own podcast? I need to. Yeah. I mean, I do deal with Rumble and uh, I just, like I said, mentally just wasn't. They've been cool with me. They haven't really put any pressure on me. I'm supposed to do like 60 episodes already. I've done two. So yeah, before we end quick, I just want to talk about that real quickly. We see a lot of content creators jumping on rumble. We saw Steve, we saw yeah. you big content creators, the rumble commercials with Steve talking about, you know, YouTube's rights and things. I'm not sure the, the ins and outs of why everybody attacks that certain niche of YouTube. Like they all talk about the YouTube rights. It seems like everybody uses YouTube. I don't have any problems with YouTube. It always works well for me. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that people are transitioning to rumble? I think people transition to Rumble is because they're a lot just more lenient when it comes to flagging things. And so with YouTube, you can go and fucking just upload, you know, some shit and kind of just not know. Like, for instance, when we did our Trump interview, like they flagged us for like electoral fraudulent talk or something random. Like Rumble wouldn't do that. So when the Trump episode got taken down, um, or at least unless they did it, you know, sneakily and did it to just put it on full mm -hmm. send and draw eyeballs to full send, which they could have very much done and faked that whole takedown. Um, but I think that just they're just way more lenient when it comes to just allowing creators to just speak their mind on anything without, you know, having to worry about being demonetized or, you know, fuck, mm -hmm. you know, be taken away or taken off the, you know, whatever. Because you can work like a Steve. He works so hard for YouTube and he just got fucking ripped off. That's crazy. Yeah. So did YouTube delete Steve will do its YouTube actual channel? I think so. I believe so. I mean, you never know what those guys are doing over there with Elk and John. They're crafty. But I think that, no, that was real. I think that that he got his channel deleted. The only thing I might be a little skeptical is that, that, that Trump interview when they said it got taken down off YouTube. Uh -huh. I don't know. I mean, maybe it did. I think they showed the picture of it getting ripped down, but it wouldn't have been, wouldn't have surprised me if they had just kind of organically removed it and then shoved it on fullsend.com where you could only watch it to just drive mass eyeballs to that. How, who set up that interview with Trump? <sighs> Fuck. I mean, Three in the morning, I fucking started the process. I had the Secretary of Defense and another guy from the CIA coming down to talk to us because I wanted to have, like, I wanted to make a really impactful interview on the timing of everything. Like, you know, like Russia just invaded Ukraine. And so I was like, what, like, let's stay up to speed on that shit. Like Antonio Brown, when Antonio Brown yeah. took his shirt off, that was a huge story, right? I was like, all right, let's go get Antonio. I went and got Antonio. It was a big, we beat everybody. Barstool beat everybody for that interview. Same thing with that. I was like, fuck. You know, I want to talk to somebody who knows what the fuck's going on with Russia, Ukraine. It's an interesting story. And it hits a whole different demo. And so I was with Steve in the hotel room and popped a little Adderall at three in the morning. I was like, you know what? Let's put the Secretary of Defense and the other guy on hold for a minute. I really want, like, now's the time to get the president. So I just want ape shit for like 10 hours straight on my phone. Just hitting up all the government guys, all the people. Dana White, who was the one at the, at the end of the day that pushed it through, uh, who got Trump. But there was a lot of work between three and 10 where I just like was, you know, I started the process of being like, now's the time. I think they would have got Trump no matter what through Dana, but it was just the timing of it. was. Important. And then how did, how did the conversation with Trump go? Hey, Trump, we want you to be on our podcast. So after I had called Dana several times and he picked up the phone, he's like, are you in jail? What's going on? Cause I FaceTime like 60 times. Cause I just was like, I want the fucking get the president on here. He basically was just like, all right, let me call Kyle and call Kyle. And they talked. And uh, then Dana just basically called Trump. And next thing you know, Trump was just like, yeah, I'm in. And uh, we went down to Mar-a-Lago. And when you got down there, how was Trump? It, he was cool. I mean, we right when we walked in, first of all, I, mean, I, I worked for like 20 hours to make this fucking just start the process of it. And Kyle was always bashing me and me and like, yeah, look at the Trump administration doesn't know who you are, like busting my balls and shit. I was like, all right, fuck you, buddy. So to fuck with him, I texted my guys when we pulled up there because I knew some of the Secret Service guys involved. And we pull up in the van, and it's like eight of us in the van. And the car opens, and they're like, hey, listen, I need every motherfucker's ID in this car except for this guy. Pointing to me. And I was just like, fuck you, Kyle. They don't know who I am. Suck my dick. And so then uh, we fucking go in there, and they fucking wand us and shit. And they're basically like, yo, listen, here's the rule. I mean, Steve's got like a, two six-packs of like happy dad seltzers. Like we're high because we all smoked weed in the winter van before. And uh, 
they're wanting us, checking us for shit. And they're like, just don't wander or we're going to kill you. So they kept us in this little room. And then we sit down and me and Kyle look at each other like, what the fuck are we going to talk about? Before you know it, he walks in and he's like, Dana White owes you a huge favor. <laughs> huge favor. <laughs> he's like, this is going to be the biggest thing you've ever seen. And I was just like, whoa. I'm like, holy fuck. This is actually happening. And then we were sitting down and the president's right here. But we kind of like, you know, we spoon fed him that. Like we didn't really ever. He must have loved us because like we didn't really challenge him. I think we just gave him the floor to just brainwash the whole entire. Are you not a Trump fan? No, I, 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 I have no problem with Trump at all. I, trust me, I, I'd rather see that than what's going on now. That's amazing. So that's probably the biggest guess you've gotten for, for the note boys, right? I, but I'm not going to consider that. That wasn't me. That wasn't really me. That was, it was that was that I was the, I arranged the timing of it and pushed it and made it happen that at that time that would have happened. I think regardless at any time, but that was a Dana white move. That was a Dana and time. Dana white and Trump are like best friends, right? Yeah. He speaks at his the national. Yeah. National, yeah. All that stuff I saw him. that video of Dana talking about how he was always there for him. Yeah. It's good. It's yeah. cool. All right. Bob Mennery. One of the most exciting podcasts we've had. We went all over the place with this. We got a good this behind the scenes look the about him. We got to feel the raw, real rugged Bob Mennery. And we got to learn a little bit about things he likes and things he does. I know a lot of you guys see him on the internet and think he's just wild or emotional on his stories, but there's a lot more to this man than, than meets the eye. Bob, it's amazing to have you on the Jackson podcast. I think, I think to end it, we got to get, yeah, I'm Bob Mennery. You're watching the Jackson podcast, but we need that like really nice Buffalo Wild Wings voice. And you're on the Jackson podcast. I'm Bob Mennery. Make sure you stay tuned. The next episode will be a lot more normal and better than this one was. Take care, everyone.